Chapan is going to uh, tell you all about agriculture, and um, he's a, a researcher at UC Merced, outreach agent, specialist on how climate change affects agriculture, and as I mentioned, he was very important to us in developing our story for Pacific Vision. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, Jerry, for uh, inviting me to give this broader perspective talk, and, and thanks, everybody, for joining late evening. Um, I hope it is worth it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I think, it's, as I said, it's, it's going to be um, a broad overview of climate change and food security. I mean, we, we think about food security and uh, how climate change is impacting food security globally and in California and how California plays a role. I'm a cooperative extension specialist based in UC Merced. Um, so the, the cooperative extension is every land grant institution has a branch where we uh, take the science and transfer it into more meaningful ways for stakeholders to understand. So the, uh, every county has the cooperative extension. They previously called agents. Now it's called uh, farm advisors. And, and we are more, so specialists are more in the, the university campus and then doing more research and, and work with the farm advisors. Um, so today I'm going to talk, uh, here's an outline. Uh, first I'll start with the definition. Food security means different thing to different people. So uh, in a broader term, how do I envision food security? So I, I like one of the definitions from uh, United Nations, um, and then I'll share it with you. And uh, talk about global undernourished population. Jerry alluded to, to that somewhat, um, and I'll, I'll talk about the, the undernourished population and how it is being impacted by climate um, globally. And so different magnitudes of of the undernourished people and, and vulnerability uh, to food insecurity. Uh, then next one is global climate vulnerability, climate change. So I'll start with some of the trends, uh, what we have been experiencing in the past and what might be expected in the future and how it is going to impact agriculture. And um, climate change, when we think about agriculture, climate change, food security, California has a major role to play. We are global leaders in many of the crops and commodities that we grow. So when we think about global security, uh, food security, California is always, uh, should be in the discussion. And so I'll talk about the uh, role of California, why it is important, and, and what are we facing here in California as a challenge to climate change and agriculture. Feel free to stop me anytime if you have questions, so yeah. Okay, uh, what is food security? This is the slide from uh, uh, one of the United Nations supported programs. Three main components, food availability, food access, and food utilization. So people are considered food secure when they have availability and adequate access at all times to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain healthy and active life. So when we think about food availability, food must be available in sufficient quantities. Um, so that's the availability aspect, access. People must be able to, reg to regularly acquire adequate quantities of food through different means. Um, and then that also accounts for affordability too. And food utilization that talks about the nutritional aspect. So uh, when we think about production declines, yes, production is important, but food security also needs to take those components into account. Uh, production does imp impact all these different uh, variables of food security. Forget, I mean, um, the, you know, don't pay attention to the, the numbers. I just pulled a slide from uh, one of the papers. Um, but this picture shows where most of the global undernourished people, uh, population live. It's mostly in the tropics and subtropics region around the globe. Um, 
in terms of severity, uh, most of the Africa is more severe, followed by Asia and Latin America. What are the colors? No, sorry. Uh, yeah, don't don't pay attention to the colors. I think the all the colors are are basically the poor, um, insecure, or the, the malnourished people uh, live, um, and and all the gray color is basically uh, it's not significant. So so the more developed part of the world is is not experiencing that undernourished population. And I can I can get the better slide where you can have more description of this. So this is um, from the, the data uh, from 2005 until now. A uh, number of undernourished pop, pop people in the world. Um, and as you can see, there was on a declining side for a while. And then from 2014 onwards, it again started to go up. And uh, 2017 estimated value is about 821 million people, uh, which are going to be undernourished. Uh, and, and, and this is also projected to increase in the future. And I think that has to do with the population growth as well. OK, and so in terms of uh, this undernourished population, and when we think about food security, um, there are three columns. So the the oops, sorry, yeah. So the the middle column is Sub-Saharan Africa, and and this is the calories in general consumed by undernourished population. Um, it's mainly wheat, maize, sorghum, rice, and and if we account for all this, fifty-seven percent of the calories are accounted through this uh, crops. In, uh, uh, and in, in, this is the individual percent of calories. So cassava, 18%, maize, 17%, wheat, 8%, sorghum, 8%, rice, 6%. For Southeast, South Asia, rice is the main commodity there, 29, almost 30%. Uh, and if we account for rice, wheat, maize, uh, sorghum, main crops, it accounts for almost 80% of the, the calories that uh, undernourished population um, consumes. And this is the global statistics on that. So rice being the first, followed by wheat, sugarcane, maize. Yeah, 56, uh, almost 99% there. And uh, so, we know that rice, wheat, corn, uh, these are the important crops, especially when we think about feeding the, the additional 2.5 billion people. Uh, these are the foods that are going to be more important in the future. There are so many different studies uh, on, on looking at the, the production declines with respect to climate change, and this is one of those studies. Um, especially since this, all these different studies deal with models. So all the models come with uncertainties. And in this paper too, they're comparing their model versus different models. But in general, um, rather than paying attention to the individual numbers, at least what we can say is every single model is showing the declining trends. So, for example, South Asia rice uh, in location in, in northwestern India. Um, in this study, there is a decline about four percent, whereas a uh, few other models. These these crop simulation models are 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 very well known and very well utilized around the globe. So the numbers are more reliable there too, and so they show 10% decline in yield. And this is a sensitivity study. So basically what it shows that what happens if we increase temperature by one degree Celsius. So this is the impact we are going to experience, uh, almost a 10% decline in the yield. Uh, if we focus on wheat, there is different range of numbers all the way from 
2% to almost 17%. Yes. So there was a slide that Jerry had showed um, where the impact of climate change, say, in the Philippines was, was moderate. Uh -huh. So is that moderate impact of climate change enough to aggravate and say the Philippines is so sensitive to temperature increases as far as CO? Yeah, and then again, I think, as, as I said, it's, it's different. The way different model works or, or takes into account you might see a lot of different sensitivities uh, in, in general. So, you know, one study or the, the numbers in one study might not relate well to the other study. But I think, yeah, I mean, in, in general, I think um, it depends on, on uh, what they take into account. So did they take into account all the management practices? What are the typical practices that you use, whether you are using water stress, whether you are not using water stress? So. I don't know uh, what went into that study itself, but I think in, in this one, at least I know that all these numbers are statistical models which are not very rigorous in terms of they, they kind of relate to different parameters. And then these one are more mathematical models, and so they take a lot of parameters into account. But again, I mean, you know, I, I yeah, it, it, and then I think those numbers um, the conclusion we should get from this is, is basically we might see a declining trend. It might be 10%, it might not be 10%, but I think it's, it's just a declining trend. Yeah. So one degree is still one degree. Yes, okay. yes. That's how you reach it. That's right, how you reach exactly, it. yeah. And so <clears throat> and I think uh, when you look at the IPCC report, I think the, the, the projection of increases is at least going to be one degree. It can be even more than one degree with respect to the, the, glow, I mean, the higher emission scenario, what is called RCP 8.5 nowadays. So yes, uh, it, it, it looks uh, bad, but again, these are the, the models uh, just to look at the standard management, but you know, that doesn't take into account all the adaptation. So there is, an, there is a adaptation component missing in this one. Yeah. Well, and it's not one degree perfectly distributed about the planet, right? No. It's, so other, if we experience one degree average change, yeah. there'll be specific locations where the change will be greater. Sure. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So this, and, and I think uh, it's important to, to say that this is an average change. So there you are going to see those fluctuations. And those fluctuations are going to mean more than the average increase. But, but this is just to say that, you know, sometimes when we, when we have this communication with people, say, well, you know, one degree is not significant. I mean, you know, we can deal with the one degree, but right, right, exactly. And so, so uh, this is kind of the impact we might see with respect to that. Yeah. So would it be fair to look at this slide and say when Bangladesh experiences one degree, they will experience nine percent yield change? So I'm looking at the middle Southeast Asia rice line on the far right. You know, when when Bangladesh experiences their one degree change, uh -huh. perhaps the sure. For yeah, just yeah, looking at this model. But I would not even take that particular number. But I would say that yes, there is. In, in general, they are going to see this declining trend. Sometimes, when even with the increase in the temperature, if you have enough water, you might see in uh, the production increase. Yes, exactly. But, but in general, uh, since all these crops are going to be more sensitive to temperatures. Um, and I think I'll, I'll show some of the figures where it's kind of more related to California agriculture as well. So, um, so um, this is how they define different categories, food insecurity. So mild, medium, mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, mild is uncertainty regarding ability to obtain food. Um, that is considered in the mild. If you have moderate food insecurity, a person has insufficient money or resources for healthy diet, uncertain about ability to obtain food, or probably skipped meals or run out of food occasionally. So that's more in the moderate. If you consider severe food insecurity, run out of food, go on an entire day without eating at times during the year. 
nobody should be in this category. But unfortunately, uh, that severe food insecurity is, has been rising up. This is Africa. And, and th again, this is severe uh, food insecurity category. Um, it was 2014, it was 22%. It's rising up to 29%, almost 30%. Same in the Latin America, it's, it's increasing a little bit. Um, there is clearly in no significant trend in, in the more developed part of the world. Uh, and in, in general, if you consider all of those uh, uh, countries, uh, more underdeveloped countries, and, and put it in a global perspective, it's still we are seeing slightly increasing trend. Okay, so let's switch gear and start talking about um, what we have experienced in, the, in terms of global climate change and what we might experience in the future and that, that could impact agriculture. Before I start, I just wanted to distinguish because we are going to talk both about climate variability and climate change. So um, in terms of defining climate variability, it's a measure of shorter term fluctuations above or below long term average. And the long term average is typical 30 years period. And this is an example of uh, how or how, how we experience climate variability. You see this oscillation, oscillating pattern. Uh, above figure is multivariate and ENSO index. It's one of those El Nino Southern Oscillation mm -hmm. Indices, which define uh, whether we are in the El Nino, La Nina, or neutral phase. Um, all the orange is above normal sea surface temperature, blue is cooler than normal sea surface temperatures. If you look at their range, it's a shorter time frame, uh, probably six months to about two years. Um, but they do influence climate across the globe. Um, and then we, we kind of knew about El Nino and then we might have heard in the media a lot of time. There is another example, Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It's the same above normal sea surface temperature, below normal sea surface temperature. But if you look at their oscillations, it's rather longer term. So 10 years to more than 10 years period. Um, and they do influence climate as well. But if you consider their fluctuations are even shorter term when you think about climate change. So in terms of climate change is a measure of longer term statistically significant trend. It can be an increasing trend or it can be decreasing trend, depending on which parameter we are, we are analyzing. Um, and, and if it is a statistically significant for a longer period of time. So the climate variability versus climate change, it's a time frame how we look at. That's the difference between uh, both of them. So this is an animation. Uh, is it possible for you to play? This figure shows the uh, animation of um, observed temperature, uh, five years running average, and this is the time window. So in the cool, uh, the blue is cooler than normal temperature, and uh, orange and yellow is warmer than normal temperatures. And as we move 1970 onwards, you start seeing more and more orange and less and less blue which means that we are experiencing warmer than normal conditions in the recent year. And this is all observed records. Um, and this is, again, this is an anomaly, so which takes into account the average and then it's looking at above or below uh, long-term averages. And this is 2013 to 2017. And, and, and this is the scale. So uh, departure from normal is almost one to two degrees Celsius in last 100 plus years, and, and this is a global picture. But again, we might see year-to-year -year changes or fluctuations. Here is an example. This is a figure from March of this year, and if you look at United States, um, U.S. was um, well, didn't experience, so, so in other words, U.S. did not experience warmer 
and and March was not among the warmest. It was almost near normal uh, March of 2018. Two months later, this is uh, May of 2018. United States came in one of the warmest Mar May on record. So within two years, uh, within two months, we fluctuated quite a bit. If you focus on other regions, uh, Africa or, or Asia, they have similar patterns. Uh, it might it reverse even here compared to here. Um, Australia, uh, they, they experienced some warming there, but there was not. So you, you see a lot of fluctuation depending on the locations uh, within a year. But, but on an average, from 1970 onwards, every single year has been warmer than normal on record. Every single year. And when we think about El Nino, La Nina that I mentioned in the previous slide, this is an example of types of uh, variations in climate we might experience with respect to uh, El Nino or La Nina conditions. So top figure is El Nino during the winter time. And uh, if you see US, the northwestern edge um, experience or or expected to experience warmer than normal uh, warmer conditions and and cooler and better conditions in the southern part of the United States. Um, the bigger patch uh, in Asia and and uh, part of part of Asia uh, could could experience warmer and drier conditions in in the El Nino years, whereas in the summertime, many parts would not experience any connection with El Nino, but, but there are a few patches where they do experience significant climate changes, uh, climate variations. Um, and in La Nina year, the trend almost flipped. So in the, during the La Nina year, you could expect cooler conditions in the northern, northwestern edge and uh, more warm and dry conditions in the, in the southern part. And so the point I wanted to make is, is this short-term fluctuations do influence climate across the globe, and, and that is still considered more as climate variability. But the, the variability and, and the, the above and, and below normal ranges or the fluctuations could influence um, climate quite significantly. Here is an example. So I don't exactly know how they calculated it, um, but what it shows is uh, this is 2015 to 2017, which is uh, El Nino year, uh, El Nino period. Um, during the El Nino period, the drought warming is significantly higher in many parts of Africa and in Latin America compared to 2004 to 2017 period. So this shows, and this is again uh, across the, the cropping region of the globe. So this figure shows number of years with frequent hot days over agricultural cropping regions. And comparison is between 2011 to 2016 compared to the long-term average. So all the red area, what it shows is that we are experiencing uh, more than normal, more frequent hot days or the extreme heat events um, in agriculture for across the globe. And more specifically, when we think about extremes, we have different types of extremes, extreme heat events, drought, floods, other things. Orange bar shows that this um, developing countries or, or uh, uh, more vulnerable middle income, low to middle income countries, percentage of countries exposed to three, two, three to four different types of climate extremes. So not just one, but three to four climate extremes during this time frame versus 20, 2001 to 2005 and onwards, it's going on an increasing trend. And, and 
the impacts due to this are going to be much more devastating than and and uh, this color is is uh, countries exposed to one extreme so th that is also rising up but more specifically adding more than one extremes is is also yeah and that's a that's an amazing curve for such a short time frame you know you, you look back at the historical changes you read sure. in the history books we live through this right i mean we see it in our lifetime absolutely yeah and 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 i think you know uh, there was another there is another figure i'll show it in a later uh, which shows the trend within the United States. And if you see the, you know, the time from 1900 to 1950, you see, you know, gradual fluctuations. And then the single day extreme precipitation events is kind of picking up. And then we are seeing those extremes even, even now. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think one of the leading recommendations, and then that's also my conclusion is rather than adapting to average, we have to be more proactive to adapt to those extremes. Wouldn't you say being proactive would have something to do with population? Have there been studies made about climate extremes and the fertility rate? Every time you look at photographs of food impacted countries and everything like that, you see yeah. mostly children. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that is a big question on how we have to address that. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And I, I mean, you know, children are, are the most vulnerable to this extreme, especially when we think about the, the yeah. underdog countries. Yes. But yeah. I agree. And so I think this is, you know, the important figure too is this is, again, the global um, figure. It's so it's not just US, but <clears throat> I think when we think about all these different extremes, drought is among the among the the most uh, devastating extreme impacting agriculture, followed by storms and uh, the volcanic eruption, um, and 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 that's again on the global scale. When we think about agricultural impacts, different subsectors of agriculture. Crops being impacted the most, followed by livestock, and 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 there is a positive sign for fisheries. There is only a tiny impact. So you know, if, when we think about vulnerability, we might have more production from the fishery side, and that could alleviate some of those impacts um, with the extremes. Yeah. This is the figure about labor productivity. So we saw extreme heat events are going to be more and more in the future. That's going to impact ag labor productivity. Um, and, and especially for crops which do require uh, uh, non-mechanized ag labor, I think that those are the crops and, and the, the places where it's going to be a bigger issue. Look at India. The entire entire country is, and, and it, given that, in terms of production, um, it's it, it's one of those high production countries. Um, most of the the production mm -hmm. is not very efficient, and a lot of labor involved, and so that's definitely going to impact, uh, and with respect to all kinds of extremes, but more specifically to heat events. Somebody was talking about the human health. So uh, this, there, this is a good schematic from uh, CDC that shows this different types of climate and weather events and how it's going to impact human health. So the changes in the sea level rise, extreme weather, rising temperatures, uh, increased CO2 level, and how it's changing or how it is impacting human health. Um, it, this is a, a good schematic and, and um, I, I encourage you to uh, follow the, the link to, to get more information how it is. So, but human health is, is a big issue. I mean the climate change impact on the human health. 
when we try to relate in terms of agriculture, more specifically, developing countries are going to be much more vulnerable to climate extremes than the developed countries. Um, and uh, in terms of disease carrying bacteria or insects, they are going to migrate to um, warmer and warmer, uh, so, so the, the cooler and cooler regions and then those regions are going to be more vulnerable in the future. And uh, there is going to be a big impact on the labor productivity aspects too of agriculture. So in general, climate change and food security Increase frequency and intensity of, this is again from a recent FAO report, sorry, um, and, and uh, the broader conclusions, they stressed very highly on the extremes. And, and more specifically, these impacts tend to be more severe for developing world. And in terms of food insecurity, it's specifically going to be more severe for countries where livelihood is predominantly based on agriculture and where the agriculture is predominantly based on weather because many of those countries they don't have a luxury of irrigation or resources to to deal with those extremes uh, as we have here and so their impacts are irreversible and then their livelihood depends on it so those are the countries are going to be more impacted um, with respect to climate change. So um, we talked more about global picture and, and global challenges. Um, now I'm shifting gears and talk about California and why California is important in terms of global food security. We live in a Mediterranean climate, so where most of our rainfall, snowfall, comes during the winter time and, and we have clear sky, full sunny summer under which crops thrive under this environment. And that's the reason why we have more than 76,000 farms producing more than 400 different commodities. It's impressive. Um, I, I used to work in, in uh, I was a faculty in the University of Nebraska in Lincoln for a while and I was working on climate impact studies, and only crop I could choose was corn and soybean. <laughs> <laughs> so here I, I can pick and choose. <laughs> yeah, um, we are leading producer of all the nut crops, leading producer of fruits and vegetables for many fruits and vegetables, leading producer of milk. Um, when we think about nutrition, we are producing the food that we should be eating. So, so in, in that context, yes, we, we, we do are uh, very unique in that context and, and, and uh, all the specialty crops are, are uh, we can feel proud about California agriculture in that context. Except for all those cattle. Sorry? Except for all those cattle. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, California, uh, th these are the top 10 commodities, and I think uh, you know, most of the, the nut crops are there, some fruits and vegetables. Uh, it's a $46 billion industry, so it's a, it's a big industry. Um, but when we think about temperature or the climate change impacts, uh, California is much more vulnerable to, to, to this impact. Let's start with temperature. Um, this figure shows rate of increase in both minimum and maximum temperatures. And as Jerry was mentioning that nighttime or the minimum temperatures are increasing. So the minimum temperatures are increasing at much higher rate than the maximum. If you see uh, San Joaquin Valley, that's where a lot of nut crops and lots and lots of agriculture is happening. Temp, uh, maximum temperature only increase, and this is again based on last 100 years, so it's not a projection, it's a historical records. Maximum temperature only increase at the rate of 0 0.02 degrees Celsius per decade, and that's not significant. But if you look at the minimum temperature, it's 0 0.17 degrees Celsius per decade, significantly higher than the maximum. 
And the same scenario with Central Coast, Southern California, Northern parts, uh, and, and if you look here um, in Sierra region, uh, maximum temperatures are actually declining, but the minimum temperatures are, are rising up. And so that corresponds to earlier slow melt um, and uh, reduced snowpack, et cetera. And so there are all kinds of issues associated with the minimum temperatures. Um, this is another way of looking at the same information. This is a baseline, which is an average temperature record for 1949 to 2005. So if you consider it an, a baseline, anything departing from that is a departure from that normal baseline. So uh, orange is maximum, <clears throat> green is minimum. Uh, for in, on an average, um, departure from normal for maximum temperature, yeah. So if you had this data, and if you had the distribution of the crops um, in those different regions, uh -huh. do you, then and do you know what the, the, each crop has a temperature sensitivity? Sure. Level. So then um, if I could ask you if you know that information, which you may not, um, what is, some of these numbers are crucial, critical, well, um, and, and I think it's, it's a very good point um, that all these different crops has those sensitivity, but there is not a single variety. So some variety, I mean, it's just more complicated than just the one number because you, even if you pick almond, for example, mm -hmm. they have their optimum range, but then if you change variety, which is more susceptible to you know uh, this range you can move to that range and so there is a, a, so many different variables play into the and I think it, on an average if you if you think about microclimate in California that's why we grow strawberries in the milder climate that's why we grow nut crops in the Central Valley so that's that's probably the, the average uh, nutshell of it but we when you see um, temperature going beyond that optimum range. On an average, yes, it does going to impact crops. But more specific to going to that, that's going to be a big, big complicated question. Well, I'm going to go back to that slide again. Sure. So it can be a complicated question. But if you take, if you project what is being grown now, and let's uh -huh. choose almonds. Sure. OK, and so we're growing almonds, and we know, I know nothing about almonds. Mm -hmm. as they are today, and then you can say, well, then we need to transfer to this kind of almond or that type of Sure, thing. sure. Yes, and so that kind of studies, yes. Okay, if you are talking about the more vulnerability aspects mm -hmm. of it, there are so many studies done on, on the, the pick and choose minimum temperature ranges, but looking at these ranges and then shifting the entire crop, that's not the practical solution, I think. Uh, Right, right. That's at least because, and, and that's not practical from from growers' perspective. But what what we can say is, is, is this variety might be more vulnerable in this particular uh, optimum temperature range. Maybe you shift to this one, and so that kind of vulnerable studies, um, there are few of them that I I know of that they have done it. But I mean. The reason I'm saying that it's, it's shifting the entire system from perennial to annual, it's not practical because um, there are so many issues involved. Growers don't have enough information. As we, for example, I, I study climate and agriculture. If somebody asks me about the economics, I don't know much, anything about it. And so that's the same with growers. And so they, they can't shift the entire system. But what we can say is that within the within the system, if they change the variety, there might be some less vulnerability associated with that. Does it answer your question there? Yes. Okay. So when we think about precipitation trend, there is no trend. <laughs> you see any trend? What do you see though? No. Exactly. Lots and lots of fluctuations. Uh, and this is observed records. This is projections. 
uh, and projections all both for low and high emission scenarios. Under any of the scenarios, we are not seeing any trend at all. Um, and skills are also pretty less, but at least there is some confidence that we are going to see more fluctuations. So we are going to be vulnerable to more both drought and flood conditions in the future. This is the slide I was talking about that uh, extreme single day precipitation. Um, this is historical record. If you focus till 1980 onward, uh, 1980, 1985, there was minor fluctuations. But after that, it's rising up. This is extreme single day precipitation events. So eight out of 10 extreme single day precipitation events has been occurring since 1990. So in the recent years, it's kind of picking up. And this is the US average, by the way, it's not, the, not California. So this is the percent of land area. Um, oh, that's a good point. Because like in LA, our big floods were 1914, 1939, 1969, and then recently. And I can see those peaks, but I don't understand the. I'll have to check on the scale, but I mean, at least, at least the point is that even if we consider any unit or or any right. scale, I think it's just yeah. But I. I this is what happens when you when you take somebody's slide and don't use your own. <laughs> yeah, this is the EPA report, by the way. So they 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 must have the information there. <clears throat> um, this is California again, um, and uh, categorizing temperature and precipitation into four categories: dry, hot, wet, hot; dry, cold, wet, cold. Anything above this line is, is um, hotter than normal or warmer than normal. But more specifically, this is dry and hot category, which is, in other words, is more drought defining category. Um, all the red dots from 2000 onwards are in the hotter than normal category for California. And more specifically, out of those 15 years, nine or 10 in dry and hot category. So that calls that we are going to experience drought conditions. Uh, I mean, we, we did experience drought conditions based on the historical record, and, and that might go even further in the future. In terms of extreme, this is just an example from uh, uh, CalAdapt, which is uh, one of those online uh, tools which are supported by uh, California. Uh, state government um, and, and, and different agencies, state agencies. <clears throat> I think this is uh, for Merced, California. Uh, extreme heat events is, is basically defined is, is 90, 95th to 99th percentile, around that range, I, I don't exactly know, of the, the average temperature record. So that 99th percentile is 104 degrees. Uh, for Merced. Average number of days beyond that 104 degrees were four between 1960 to 1990. And by 2070 to 2099, we might see 40 days. It's compared to four to 40. So mm -hmm. we are going to see almost one more month, more than a month. And more specifically, um, if you see the distribution in the historical context, they were more populated between June through August. If you move into the future, they are more distributed uh, all the way from May towards October. And so that going to impact ag labor productivity and, and other issues related to agricultural production. In terms of drought, there are so many different indices that define drought. Palmer Drought Severity Index is one of the one of the most popular ones that's used for defining drought, and this is uh, for average U.S. drought monitor drought index uh, over time. And there is 
there is fluctuation, but there is no trend. Um, if, but if you focus on southwest, you start seeing this declining trend, which means that it's going to be a drought condition. So if if it is le lower than two, it, it defines as more severe drought conditions. Snowpack, uh, this is observed record. Um, on an average, entire Sierra Nevada region experienced um, reduction in the percent of snowpack in the historical context. If you look at the um, model projections, we might expect 48% loss by 2070, 2099 under low emission and even higher under high emission scenarios. There was a recent, um, maybe two years ago, the study by UCLA that showed that earlier projections um, might not be accurate and we might have more increase in the Sierra Nevada region temperatures and then we might expect even more um, reduced snowpack. So let's talk about impact, crop sensitivity. And this is very general crop sensitivity. All the crops have different complexity. Um, but when we think about which parameter is the most sensitive one for different categories. So when we think about vegetables, exposure to temperatures beyond their optimum temperature ranges is going to impact uh, vegetables quite a bit. Um, and then especially if their exposure is beyond 9 to 12 degrees, um, there is a significant yield decline with, with vegetables. When we think about perennial cropping system, remember I mentioned about uh, minimum temperature in increases. Uh, one of the downside of that is we might have reduced chill accumulations during the winter time. And many of those specialty crops do require that dormancy period uh, and acc accumulate certain chill in order to um, um, sustain and, and, and a proper bird break in the spring time. And so that chill is going to be a factor um, under low, low chill accumulation that we are going to experience in the future. <clears throat> so being an alfalfa. Elevated CO2 is uh, associated with reduced nitrogen and protein content. Corn, rice, cotton, all yield declines with respect to different aspects of temperatures. So temperature is, is going to be a bigger issue, but I think water is going to be even bigger issue. Um, this is all considering that we have enough water. If we don't have enough water, um, and again, this is another modeling study where it shows yield decline for California. And, and even in this one, there is no water stress included. It's just the uh, yield decline with respect to temperatures. There is no clear decline for alpha alpha <clears throat> because it's a, there is no reproductive side. It's just a leaf. Um, and so when, when there is a reproductive or fruits or seeds involved, you might see some declines. The bigger decline is for uh, cotton and sunflower, rice and wheat. Uh, there is slight in tomatoes. But on an average, 29% um, for cotton, 26% for sunflower, etc. And again, this is based on uh, one of those models, but they did a, a rigorous study on, on this. Uh, but I think the, the important aspect is that if we consider water stress, which is going to be um, an issue in the future, yeah. Oh, so sorry, the previous slide for the soybean and alfalfa, there is, um, it says elevated CO2 information to reduce the reduced nitrogen and protein content. So the actual crop has, the actual plant has less nitrogen. Yes. Yeah. 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 And so, um, and, and the other thing is, is uh, uh, that calls for a lot of adaptation measures. And then so, uh, you know, changing variety to do more drought tolerant or heat tolerant and things like that, then that can alleviate some of those negative impacts. Um, there was another study for Midwest on corn. Uh, again, this is not a modeling study. This is actual study uh, done by Jerry 
Hetfield and, and uh, his uh, colleague in 2015, what they showed is under normal temperature, normal precipitation, if the yield is 1500, under extreme temperatures and less than normal precipitation, you can see almost 50% reduction in, in corn. And this is actual experiment, it's not the, the modeling study. And, and they have different variables. Um, I, I'm not sure why they are, say, they are seeing even more decline under uh, more than optimum uh, precipitation. Maybe it might be during the critical growth stage. But anyways, I think the point is, uh, even the actual studies do say that extreme temperatures are going to have a bigger impact on the production for, and then this is again corn, which is one of the important crops for global food security aspects too. Uh, as I talked about chill, chill hours, well, uh, the recent uh, study showed that a good way to, to calculate the, the amount of chill required by nut crops is using more dynamic model called chill portion rather than using chill hours. Uh, but even under the chill portions, uh, under the future scenario, in the historical context, if we were accumulating 55 to 65 to all the way to 80, you might see less and less chill portions accumulations. And so crops, if that crop require a higher number of chill portions, they are going to be more vulnerable. Under, I mean, the, in, if you talk about length of the growing season, um, that's the, the length is, is defined from last spring freeze to first fall freeze. The entire growing season is, is expanding. Um, U.S. average is about 14 days. California is more than 20 days. But <clears throat> actual growing season mm -hmm. is shrinking. So there are two, two different things. Length of the growing season from you know, uh, planting last spring freeze to first fall, that is expanding. But if we talk about individual crops, we did a study recently, uh, we published it this year, what it shows that from time to planting or transplanting processing tomato in a central valley uh, to their maturity or harvest, that time window might shrink almost by 20 to 30 days compared to the current average. And so <clears throat> with that shrink, you might also expect less and less production. We, we haven't um, calculated that here, but I think, um, we, we, we could expect that too. Somebody mentioned about pest and disease pressure. Um, similar to uh, altered growth in, in crops, I think pest and disease are, uh, are going to be a bigger issue in agriculture. Uh, and I think it's just after water that's going to be the, the second major issue in agriculture. It is actually right now and it's impacting in a lot of crops. So just to give you an example, for nut crops, there is a, a very threatening pest called navel orange worm. <clears throat> Due to temperature warmings in the springs and, and the summertime, they, they used to get three generations in the, in the historical context and the third generation sometimes might coincide with their harvest time frame. And if it does, um, that impacts their harvest uh, for nut crops. In the future, we are uh, comparing a lot of different models and, and uh, locations, but on an average, what we are seeing is, rather than having three generations, in the future, we might expect five generations within a year. And, and that five generations are going to have a lot of negative impact on crops. And uh, this is a paper which kind of summarizes uh, what sort of impacts on pests and diseases we might expect um, with, with respect to temperature increases. So we might see northward migrations, upper elevations, elevated development rates for a lot of pests and diseases. New species uh, might be introduced uh, that, that might not have been possible in the, in the, in the past. Etc. And so, so there are lots and lots of 
pest and disease pressure going to be impacting agriculture with respect to temperature increases. And all this impact that I talked about in California is going to be relevant in a global climate change issues too. So it's, it's nothing new or nothing very unique. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be the, the issues in the global context as well. Um, forest, as we know, we are experiencing more and more forest fire. We might experience it in even higher in the future. Um, and, and, and forest also can impact agricultural aspects in many, many ways. Um, so in summary, recent increases in hung, uh, and hunger are associated with extreme events, especially uh, exposure to uh, extreme and high vulnerability related to agricultural and livelihood system. Um, summary about climate change and what types of impacts we might experience, uh, what we talked about was temperature increases, variability in the precipitation, less snowpack, um, less chill hours, and, and more increased uh, in, in frequency and intensity of extreme events. In terms of agricultural impacts, our, we talk about chill hours, yield reduction, um, pest and disease pressure, <clears throat> water demand is going to be a challenge, um, and, and there are many other issues may, might not have been covered here. Um, so improving resilience to climate change requires protection of natural resources and, and so and developing new strategies and scalable adaptation actions. Um, and more importantly, not just providing information, but solution needs to integrate or take stakeholders into account and then try to understand uh, local issues related to and, and, and creating solutions that are more tangible to the group. And um, this is a very small bullet points of different research needs, but I think when we think about global food security, it goes beyond just the research and, and we need to have more effective policy, resources, funding, uh, infrastructure, a lot of things that needs to take into account for improving uh, global food security measures. But on an average, I mean, in general, we need to have better understanding of uh, agricultural impacts due to extremes, different kinds of extremes, and how can we manage it. I think that's going to be a really important question we need to address. And uh, if we think about agriculture as a stakeholder, Research needs to be localized and uh, that could be adaptive, uh, adaptable at the local scale. And that needs to take into account um, not just the scientific but social and economic aspects too. Um, it goes without saying for water, we need more water relevant strategies. And, and we saw a lot of modeling work. Um, if you want to use model, uh, we should do a good work and, and we making that model ready for doing those kind of work. And with that, this is my email and phone. So uh, feel free to call me, email me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you.